Thanks, well, it's very nice to be here and uh, to uh, be here on such a nice sunny day in, in uh, Brisbane though it is raining today. Um, uh, yes, so the third age of computing and I'll say a little bit about why I got into computing and why I think it's important for uh, popularizing computing. So um, the computing universe, which, uh, which this talk is based on, is an attempt to do, oh, I better switch the mic. <laughs> Sorry about that. Thank you for reminding me. Okay, so uh, uh, it's just that um, there are lots of popular books about astronomy, about physics, about biology, about genomics, but there are very few popular books about computer science and computer engineering, and these are the things that have changed the world the most in the last 50 years and are going to continue changing the world. So I do believe it's important to understand these ideas. So. Um, In, in explaining to young people what computer science is, when I was doing e-science, I had scientists and computer scientists trying to work together. And what became quite clear to me is that the scientists, in university research scientists, had very little idea what computer scientists actually did. They thought we write programs. Well, we do, but not necessarily very well. Um, and so actually explaining that um, computer science is more than just about using a, a word processor or a spreadsheet, and it's more than just writing Python scripts, it's about algorithms. And this is really uh, what Jeanette Wing, who is at Microsoft Research now, it's, it's actually what she calls computational thinking. Uh, an algorithm following steps to get to a solution. Uh, and it all comes back um, to Alan Turing, who was a, a graduate student at Cambridge when he came up with this idea of a Turing machine uh, where he specifically uh, idealized how you would implement something on a computer uh, before computers existed. He, he, and that is a simple machine that worked very much like a human computer when it had to follow a given set of rules. So you got the, what it told you to do here, you did it and you moved on to the next, next piece on the tape and so on. And he consciously designed his Turing machine on what a human calculator, we used to call computers, used to be the people who did the calculations. And, and that's what the Turing machine. And by putting this formal way of, of what can be computed, it enabled the basis for uh, understanding algorithms and, 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 and understanding what you could do and what you couldn't do with a computer. Certain things are not computable. So uh, what is algorithmics? Well, uh, the earliest known is, is, is comes from way back by Euclid, where uh, finding the, 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 the greatest common divisor of a fraction like 8 over 12, it's obvious to us that you can divide top and bottom by 4. But if it's a bigger number, what's, the, what's, what's in fact the greatest common divisor? And what Euclid gave was a series of steps, given whatever these two numbers are, that would give you the answer. And that's an algorithm. So it was the very early days. But one of the pioneers of computing uh, in the 19th century was a man named Charles Babbage, along with uh, this lady, Ada Lovelace, that's Charles Babbage on the stamp, uh, and had the idea of building what was effectively a computer. It was called the, the, uh, the analytical engine. Uh, and uh, he recognized that when you, you had um, a result, you had an algorithm to get a result, people will say, well, is that the fastest way you can get it? Could you do it in a different way? And so on. So the study of algorithms, the study of, of which is the best way, what uses less memory, which, which uses less compute time, and so on, uh, becomes the study of, of algorithmics in computer science. And complexity theory comes from that. So that's what algorithmics is. And uh, I'll explain about, for example, what two grad students at, at, um, at Stanford did. You may have heard of them. Sergey Brin and uh, Larry Page, and they found a Google on the base of an algorithm. All right. Uh, so this is an example of sorting algorithms. Just to show you exactly what this means, you can sort these numbers, uh, these, these names, in the alphabetical order. So Bob, Ted, Alice, Pat, and so on. And what you do is you just look at the last two, and, and then you, 
you, you order them so that the, the earlier in the alphabet is above and you do it, keep going up, and it's called bubble sort for an obvious reason. But it's an enormously inefficient way of doing it because after you've done this, you have to go back and do it again and again and again. And there are many other ways of doing it. And if you analyze this, people write large numbers of papers on sorting algorithms. And one example is, is a thing called merge sort, where you have these eight, and you divide it into four, you divide it into two, and then bring them back together. And that's a much faster algorithm than bubble sort. So classifying algorithms, understanding the best way of doing it, is, is what computer science is about, what can be done, what can't be done. So this is what I used to do. This is. Um, I used to be concerned with the number of quarks in a proton, right? It's a very interesting question. Higgs boson is relevant and all that sort of stuff. But um, these, these quarks have a fractional charge. They have charge like a third of the electron charge and so on. And yet you never see a particle like a quark by itself. You only see them in together in protons. And so it's called the quark confinement problem. And here the protons are made of up quarks and down quarks. So two up quarks and a down quark gives you a proton, and so, but they never get out. So this is a, a cartoon of Gelman's quark prism, and I, that's what I used to work on, and uh, I used to, because it's, it's not something you can make small approximations in terms of a, a small perturbation, it's, a, it's a, a calculation you have to do on a computer. So that's how I got interested in computation. And what I did was I attended, uh, at Caltech, uh, this is Jeffrey Fox and Chuck Seitz, in the 80s they were building, uh, you could buy, if you had several million, you could buy a supercomputer, which was people like Cray used to sell them, which were shared memory. So you have uh, um, uh, one memory for all the, the data and you had this ways of, uh, of, of accelerating the thing using vector algorithms, it was called. This is an alternative way. Here you buy lots of cheap processes from like cheap, cheap it's essentially a bunch of personal computers and you put them together and you divide the problem among all these and so it's if you like uh, parallel computing is you know you can get an ox to plow a field or you can try and get 200 chickens and it's more difficult as you can see to get the chickens going in the same direction and so it's much cheaper but uh, it's payoff is that you have to do the, the programming. And so that's what I started doing uh, 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 after I heard a lecture at Caltech by a guy named Carver Mead, and I'll come back to that in a moment. So Carver Mead was a professor at Caltech, and he was the Gordon Moore Professor of uh, Computing. And the reason he was that was because You've all heard of Moore's Law. This is what Gordon Moore, he's, he founded Intel. So he's made a little bit of money, as you can imagine. Uh, and from these, these points here, he extrapolated and said, well, actually, the number of components on a silicon chip seems to be going up. And uh, in 65, he thought, well, maybe by the time you get to 75, there will be uh, uh, tens of thousands of processors on the chip. Well, actually, this is Moore's law, and the number of components on the chip, the number of transistors, as you see now, has reached billions on the chip. And that's what Moore's law is about. And Carver Mead um, was giving a seminar like this. It was the weekly seminar at Caltech, uh, and everybody was sitting waiting for Carver Mead to come and talk about Moore's law. And he'd forgotten about it. So someone actually went to his lab, brought him back, and he came in with a box of slides. It was very early days. This was 81. And he gave a wonderful talk about how there were no engineering obstacles to making chips smaller, faster, and cheaper for the next 30 years. Well, as we know, he was wrong. It, it was well over 30 years. But nonetheless, uh, you could see the vision that, that you had these very expensive vector supercomputers, but it was obvious that if you put lots of these little chips together, that in time, they would become much more powerful than you could build a vector supercomputer. So that's why I got interested in doing that. And this is, uh, in 1970, a solid state memory device. Building the early computers was very difficult because of memory, and I'll come back to that. And so this had, a, 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 instead of, you know, the first transistor had 
the first chip had about a, a few components on it, a few transistors and things like that. This, this one uh, had about a few thousand. And then in 1971, this is what changed the world. Um, they were asked, Intel were asked by a Japanese manufacturer of calculating machines, could they make a range of chips for calculators with different powers? And eventually the, the, the engineer Ted Hoff and his colleagues at Intel thought, well, that's a bit silly. Why don't we make one chip which we can program? And that was the idea of the microprocessor. And this had, again, a few thousand transistors. And now we have, this is a state-of-the-art chip, an Intel Xeon chip, has approximately 4 billion transistors in the same space. And it's remarkable, I think, that, that, that what, what's the triumph of computer science is, is that we can make these 4 billion transistors do something useful. How can you actually cope with the complexity of doing that? And the answer is, that's what computer science, the management of complexity is, is partly what computer science is about. Okay, so um, Richard Feynman was my hero in physics, um, and what he did in the 1980s when I was listening and changing to computing, he was also changing to computing and um, uh, gave a series of lectures at Caltech on computation. He's, he's famous for his lectures on physics, the big red books of physics. They're wonderful things. I do recommend them. They're now available on the web, uh, and they're great. But, but he also gave lectures on computing, and he talked about the limits of computing due to mathematics, due to uh, noise, due to thermodynamics, due to engineering, and due to quantum mechanics. And he came up with the idea of a quantum computer, which is uh, an idea that's being actively pursued by lots of people at the moment. But he also uh, gave a lecture at uh, an alternative therapy uh, center called Eslin on Big Sur on the Californian coast, where they have a sort of very eclectic um, audience, and it was called Computers from the Inside Out. And it was these two uh, ideas that made me think that what one should do is try and write a popular book about computer science. So that's how I got to here. Okay, enough introduction. What do I mean by the third age of computing? Well, um, Butler Lamson, who was a, a pioneer of, of, of early computing, and he's a Turing Award winner, so I'll come back to him. And so this is what he said. Every 30 years, there was a new wave of things that computers can do. Around 1950, they began to model events in the world, simulation, he called it, and around 1980, to connect people, communication. Since 2010, they've begun to engage with the physical world in a non-trivial way, and he called that embodiment. Uh, I, I think it's computers acting intelligently on your behalf. So just to give you a, 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 an example, I was with my son in England with his Volkswagen. He'd come back from the, uh, the supermarket, and he wanted to park the car, and it was rather tight. And he said, watch this, Dad, and he pressed the button, and the wheel turned itself, and the car parked itself. And that's what you'd like to happen. You know, it's, it's, the computer is steering the car, doing something intelligent, parallel parking by itself. And so that's, that's an example of, of embodiment. It's an intelligent application. And you'll see very mu many more of those, smart cars, smart buildings, smart houses, whatever. But, but there are also downsides to this. And I'd like to sort of just stress that besides the good sides, there are also downsides. I was visiting a colleague in Berkeley, California, and he, he, he works for a government lab. And he'd taken a government car to go 30 miles to another government lab at Livermore. When he got there, the person he was seeing, his boss, said, I'm terribly sorry, Horst, but I'm going to have to report you for speeding. And he said, but I wasn't stopped. The car had reported him. Okay, so you, you, you see there are downsides to most things. OK, so let's, let's take a little history tour, uh, first of all, to uh, the beginnings of computers. So these are uh, Presper Eckert and, and John Morchley were the people, the two engineers who built a thing called the ENIAC. And it was a huge thing, weighed, weighed 30 tons, it was 80 feet long, had uh, you know, tens of thousands of vacuum tubes, uh, and uh, was programmed by wiring them together. And these are some of the original programmers who were actually largely women uh, on the ENIAC. Uh, and the engineers and the programmers worked together, and it took several, uh, you know, uh, up to a day or more to set the computer up to solve a particular problem. And it was actually trying to calculate 
trajectories of, of, of shells from a gun because it was the Second World War and they were getting behind, they wanted to automate it. And so this is the computer that they built to do that. And these two people went on to found the computing industry in the USA. Um, but actually, uh, having built the ENIAC, where you had to actually put the program in by hand, they realized that you could actually have the data and the program stored in memory, as we do now. And the first, the idea of a stored program computer was put forward. And they widely circulated the, the plans of that around the world. And, and the first one was actually built uh, in Cambridge, England. Another one was built in, in, in Australia, in, in Canberra, actually. Uh, and uh, the first operational electronic digital stored program computer was a program, was a computer at Cambridge University built by this man, Maurice Wilkes. And the reason that they were first, because von Neumann, a great eminent mathematician who'd been advising on the ENIAC, was trying to build one at Princeton. Uh, and they were having difficulty, and the difficulty was because of the memory. They hadn't got the solid state memory, and they were trying to, to do that. This is the memory device that Wilkes had, and he had a secret weapon. And the secret weapon was an astrophysicist called Tommy Gold. He's a famous astrophysicist. He's the guy who figured out what pulsars are. Pulsars are rotating neutron stars, and that was his suggestion. But during the war, he'd been working on radar. And in radar, you have a sweep of the radar, and then you have to sort of compare it with the one before to see if anything's moved. And so you have to delay the signal. And you build these, this is a mercury delay line, and the signal goes up and down, and you can delay the signal and then compare the new signal and see if anything's changed. So he built these things, and that helped Wilkes actually build the computer. But of course, having built the computer, that's only the beginning of the problems, and this is a nice quote from Maurice Wilkes. I can remember the exact instant when I realized a large part of my life from then on was going to be finding mistakes in my own programs. Now, I think we've all had that experience. Um, and this, this man here, uh, David Wheeler, was um, probably the first computer science PhD. Uh, and um, they used to program in machine code, which is very complicated. And you know, if you had to multiply two matrices together, to getting the actual thing working was difficult. And then lots of people wanted to multiply two matrices. So why should you make all of them go through all that pain? Why not put the thing into a library? Well, there was a problem because when you're going through the computer, you go from instruction to instruction to instruction. It tells you where to go to get the next thing. So what this man did was invent what was called the Wheeler jump. So you're going here, you jump to where the library piece of code is, and then you jump back to the program. And so it enabled you to build libraries, and that's what these guys did. And, and Wheeler and, and, and Wilkes wrote one of the first books on programming as a result. Okay, and then, then development happened pretty, pretty fast, and, and this is just a, a shot of IBM was the synonymous with computing in the 1960s and, and so on, and this is a sort of typical view of an IBM facility. Uh, and of course, this is what programs look like, these are bunches of punched cards. Anybody remember punch cards here? Uh, some old people. Good, I'm pleased to see that, yes. I remember. It was not a good thing to drop your deck of cards because if you had to shuffle them, it didn't work. Um, uh, so uh, that's how we used to do that. Uh, but then in the 70s, so many interesting things happened, the personal computer. But uh, before we get there, I'd like to just uh, talk about where all the things that we now use take for granted, windows and, and, and icons and all this sort of stuff. It came from Xerox Park, which was a, a research center run by Xerox in Palo Alto. And this is uh, Chuck Thacker, but he's the, the hardware engineer, he's the architect. And they were the people who put together this machine called the Alto. And it, it had the first WYSIWYG word processor, uh, it, it had Ethernet connections, it had a Windows mouse interface, it has a laser printer attached to the network, all the things that you'd think, you know, we have now. Uh, uh, and they had almost everything there. Uh, and uh, these are the people here. This was their vision of the local area network at Xerox Park. This is Bob Metcalf and David Boggs, and they were the people who invented Ethernet. And so uh, now you, you think it perfectly commonplace, but it was invented in the early 70s at Xerox Park. 
uh, and it led to an interesting area, era in the 70s when instead of the professional computer scientists or the professional computer industry people taking the next step forward, it was actually taken forward by hobbyists, people who wanted to build computers just for fun to play games on and things like that. And uh, you might recognize this, this person here, that's Bill Gates, and this is Paul Allen. When they were at school, they were actually very uh, excited by computers and spent their lives immersed in computers. And when uh, Intel produced a new chip and, and this company produced the, this, this, uh, the Altair kit, you could go and build a computer, it was a very primitive thing. You could build a box which looked like that, but to put a program in, you had to toggle these switches. And so what was needed was some software that would make this usable by ordinary people. And these guys wrote the first basic compiler. And this is Microsoft when they were in Albuquerque. And this is the other area. This is the Apple. This is, uh, originally you had to build your own box to put the Apple in. Uh, Steve Jobs, of course, recognized that you, most people didn't want to build their own. They wanted something. And so this is the, the, the Apple One, which was actually uh, packaged nicely. It didn't have any programs to run on it, but it, it certainly uh, looked nice. And uh, they were saved because of this, the killer app for the PC. It was the only application they didn't have at Xerox Park. It was the spreadsheet. And this is the guy, uh, Dan Bricklin, was sitting in a lecture at MBA at Harvard, and he was contemplating doing all these scenarios for business plans, and he realized how easy it would be if you could automate it on a computer, and that was the idea of the spreadsheet. And this is the, the plaque at Harvard Lecture Theater where Dan Bricklin was daydreaming, and he says, uh, produced the spreadsheet. So that's what actually made um, uh, this sort of scenario possible and made it industry began to take seriously that the spreadsheet was something that that was actually useful to industry and it, so it was beyond the gaming industry uh, and then of course IBM came in and this is their campaign about the IBM personal computer this was the project they did with uh, Microsoft uh, and um, whoops sorry wrong one control alt delete uh, uh, they on the board that they were making they didn't have enough space to put a reset button. So the, the engineer at, at IBM, uh, just David Bradley his name was, decided that, you know, make it as difficult as possible for you to hit it by accident. That's why you have control alt delete. And um, there was an interesting debate with Bradley and Bill Gates. And Bill Gates was complaining about, you know, you guys were the forced everybody, you know, the control alt delete was really stupid. And Bradley said, but yes, but you're the guy who made everybody have to use it. <laughs> Which was, of course, true. Mm. Okay. Uh, and then, of course, uh, you know, games were sort of things done illegally on these very expensive, rare things at universities. They were done by grad students in the middle of the night. When I was at Caltech in 1981, I was playing uh, Star Trek on my computer, uh, uh, on the Vax computer, but I was playing from home at 3 a.m. in the morning. I got a message from Stephen Wolfram saying, stop playing Star Trek. So it was sort of frowned upon, but everybody did it. Uh, and now it's a billion dollar industry. And this was, this is Pac-Man, of course. And it was one of the first games that actually appealed not only to men, space invaders and so on, but also to women. Okay, so that was, we, we learned how to do computation and spreadsheets and things like that. And the first 30 years, that's what they did. They calculated, and they're very good at calculating, much better than we are. Um, but then um, connecting them together. And there's a, 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 was a famous professor, J.C.R. Licklider, who was a professor of psychology at Harvard. And he had the idea of connecting computers together and sharing resources and so on. Uh, and that would be a good thing to do. And so. He then went to a funding agency, it was called ARPA, the Advanced Research Projects Agency. Nowadays it has a D in front, Defense Research Projects Agency. Uh, and this is the, the first four nodes of the ARPANET, which was in 1969. And this was the first time they connected computers together. Uh, these were all on the West Coast. 
That's because the people on the East Coast where had developed all these things, they didn't want to share their computers. People at MIT didn't want to share their computer with people at Stanford. So uh, they were slow to catch on, but they did catch on. And so uh, relatively few years later, this was the state of the ARPANET. I used to use the node at UCLL, UCL in London, and to log on to, to things, uh, computer at Caltech, actually, uh, uh, using the ARPANET. And that was uh, the killer application, however, was typically not people using other people's computers or sharing resources and things like that. The killer application was, of course, email. But they discovered that, you know, 75% of the applications of the ARPANET, people sending email messages. And this is the man, uh, Ray Tomlinson, who was an engineer at the people who built the first prototype uh, network. Uh, and he realized that you could, instead of just sending mail on the same computer in the same place, you could send your mail to a computer somewhere else. And he introduced this, the, the at sign. And this is a, a representation of the internet today many, many, many uh, millions and billions of nodes here. Uh, about a third of the people on the planet are connected to the internet nowadays. But how do you make that usable? Well, this is um, Tim Berners-Lee, uh, and he was a, a physicist from Oxford who went into computing, and he was a computer, at, uh, at, computer engineer at CERN, and he had the idea of, of, of making um, hypertext links, uh, which, which could go, hypertext had been invented by people like Doug Engelbart for going in a document, you go from this document, go pick the link to another document, and you had this ways of going through documents. And he had the idea of actually making that on a different computer, rather like Tom Linson's email, and that's how the web was born. And this was the first photo put on the web. Uh, it was a, a group of amateur group at CERN uh, who were friends of Tim. This was the first photo. And the worst web browser was actually built. The, the graphical web browser that we all know and love uh, started off at uh, Illinois uh, at Netscape. Uh, there's a monument to, to prove it. OK, so uh, what about new applications? Networking computers is all very well. Um, but in the 1990s, um, I was using a browser called Alta Vista. Anybody remember Alta Vista? You're old, you see. But, but, uh, and it was the best. It was really pretty good. Uh, and, and these guys came along, uh, and they realized that what they wanted to do was find the important, when you type in a, 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 a topic, how could they find the page most relevant to you? And so instead of just looking for the number of times it's referred to on the pages to give you the most significant one, they looked at the number of links. It's very similar to what academics ordinarily do. I mean, Larry Page's father was an academic, and so he understood about when you write a paper, you're concerned about how many citations you get, how many people quote your paper. And it's very similar to that, the number of links pointing to your page. And of course, if a Nobel Prize winner cites you, that's more important than if I cite you. Right? And so uh, they took account of that, and that was their algorithm called PageRank. Sorry, wrong one. Uh, uh, and uh, they tried to sell that algorithm. So it counted all the, the links on your page, and that was the way they determined the importance, and it was a new way of doing it. They set it up on the Stanford campus. People liked it, and they tried to sell it. They tried to sell it to AltaVista, who were owned by digital at the time, and AltaVista said, no thanks. So they went then to Yahoo, and they tried to sell it to Yahoo. And Yahoo said, no thanks. Uh, but one of the founders of Yahoo, uh, David Filo, had also been a Stanford grad student, said actually, you know, what we found was it might be a good idea to set up a company of your own. So they did. And you see the reason. OK, so Google came from an algorithm, basically. So they had a clever algorithm for determining the importance of web pages in response to search terms. And that algorithm is worth many, many billions of dollars. And of course, other applications, when you connect computers, social computing, this is uh, a, a nice movie, The Social Network, about Facebook, uh, which I particularly don't get to 500 million friends without making a few enemies. Uh, is a, it's an interesting movie, not enormously accurate, but interesting nonetheless, uh, and I recommend it. Um, okay, 
along with the good things, there's also the bad things. This is a slide from the Digital Crimes Unit at Microsoft showing the number of infected computers with botnets. Everybody know what a botnet is? That's a, a piece of software which controls your computer, and your computer can be used to send spam out to all sorts of people. It can be used also to read all your confidential uh, information, and it's run by typically gangs in, in Eastern Europe, all right, or in China. Uh, and this shows just one particular botnet, and you can see that Spain doesn't look like a good place to be, nor does Mexico, and Brazil and, and the US are pretty bad. Canada looks pretty good, but nobody lives in Canada. <laughs> and, and, and similarly, Australia, right? You know, so, but okay, so it really, really, can I just say, it's really important to make sure you have your defenses up and, and make, make sure you have your, uh, your uh, computer regularly screened for viruses because they can be some really nasty things happen uh, with viruses. Okay, so those are ancient history. And now we're entering a new age where computers act intelligently, do things we want them to do. So let's uh, have a look and see, uh, and I'll give you an example of some, a computer doing the sort of things that we would like. So let me see if I can get this running. What if your car could actually see what's ahead and respond right in the moment? A radar sensor and advanced cameras, including a new stereoscopic camera in the windshield, allow intelligent drive to recognize objects 360 degrees around the vehicle. Radar sensors give it foresight. Long, short, and multi-range radar scan the environment in front of the car, behind it, and out from the rear corners. The intelligence comes from insight. Advanced computing power interprets what it sees determines the best response, and springs into action faster than humanly possible. The systems of intelligent drive can recognize a pedestrian entering your path, vehicles ahead slowing to a stop, and even cross traffic at a near... I don't know why that happened, but okay. It'll also break and, and uh, uh, break for you if you need to and make sure you don't hit something. Um, uh, as is this example. So I don't know what happened to the, the sound. Okay, so that's a, a video from Mercedes showing the sort of things that they've been playing with for many years, actually. And Tesla have just announced that they've downloaded software to all the Tesla cars, which have some sort of features like this intelligent drive. But that's um, slightly scary, as we'll come back to. Um, how do these things work? How do they recognize a car from a person, for example. Well, that's because clever algorithms are at play, and these are the sort of algorithms that are going to be embedding uh, all the, the advanced applications in this, in this third age of computing. And so this is one of the earlier types. There are many types. This is a particular type. It's called a neural network, and uh, basically uh, it's meant to model at some very primitive level what our neurons in our brains do and you have an input layer. Uh, for example, you could have a number plate recognition. And so you want to recognize a letter. And then from the output, you put the number, you put the image in here, and you want to train these links. So you, you work out the connectivity and, and, and the weights, they're called, on these links. And you, 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 you have the desired output, which says it's an L. Uh, and then you, 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 you train the, the, the connections so that uh, when you give it an L here, it lights up this particular one here and so on. And so you can recognize given numbers and you can automate, for example, when you're driving, it picks up your number plate and reports you for speeding and you get a ticket in the post, for example. So uh, that uh, was one of the early machine learning activities that you can train for a given input, you can train what output uh, and recognize letters, numbers, and things like that. Uh, and what's great excitement nowadays is that by having multiple hidden layers, these are called, you can actually do all sorts of things. And now people are getting close to doing speech recognition, not as well as humans, but getting much, much better. And they've made real progress in recognizing images. I mean, 
a three-year-old child can recognize the difference between a cat and a dog, but the computer finds that very difficult. And so nowadays we're making real progress on both images and for speech using algorithms like this. This is one example. All right. So um, another example uh, is this is a Microsoft Research uh, have this uh, program called Connect, which is a 3D camera. So you can tell which, which parts are closer and which parts are far away. And it's a very clever system. So if the two people are standing playing a game, they can recognize it's my hand rather than the person's hand next to me. And they, it, they have to do training on all sorts of shapes of people, sizes of people, uh, doing all sorts of different actions. And so they train it on millions and millions of images to recognize that they can tell that it's my hand rather than the hand next to me. And they also do sound engineering. So they have a very complicated system of microphones. So in the noisy room with lots of people talking, they can tell it's my voice talking rather than the person next to me or someone else in the room. So it's using these very sophisticated algorithms. This doesn't use neural networks. This uses uh, what are called decision trees, decision forests, where it's like 20 questions. You keep asking questions and it narrows down to a particular choice. So these are um, uh, another example of um, uh, a machine learning algorithm. Now, uh, the cloud also transforms mobile devices. So if I get my phone out here, all right, uh, it's, it's a Windows phone. So I guess most of you have iPhones. So you will talk to Siri, but I talk to Cortana. And if I talk to Cortana and say, Cortana, open the pod bay doors, all right, what happens is that the signal isn't processed here. It's processed up in the cloud with large numbers of processes where it figures out what I said, it figures out an answer, and then generates a speech in reply and sends it down to the phone. And so Cortana says, I'm sorry, Tony, I can't do that. <laughs> um, in less than a second. And so it makes devices like this into hugely powerful computers. So connectivity to the cloud is really transforming all these sort of mobile devices. They're really going to be very, very powerful computing devices, and they'll do all these clever algorithms. So that's one of the ways we'll get lots of smartness in, in future applications. So this is Cortana. Uh, comes from Halo 2, and that's Master Chief. Cortana is his artificial intelligence. Uh, that's the least pornographic image I could find of Cortana. <laughs> okay. So um, you will see, therefore, these embodied applications, intelligence, you know, Mike, uh, Apple's uh, iWatch. I mean, it can now measure your heart rate. It can tell that you can send a signal to the doctor saying, you know, uh, you've got high cholesterol. It can tell that you've just had a heart attack, and it can all sorts of do all sorts of clever things that you would think is a good idea. It can also monitor exactly where you are, what you're doing, and everything else, which may not be so good, right? But but those are the sort of applications because they know where you are, and they, they, they know all your diary, they know who you're visiting, and so on. They can tell you useful things, but they can also perhaps tell you things that you'd rather not everybody know. Uh, and then this is a, a Microsoft uh, Skype. I can now speak uh, in English to a colleague in China, and my voice will come out in China speaking Chinese. I don't speak Chinese. And then they speak in Chinese, and it comes back in English. And so this is now available. Uh, it's not perfect, but it is the beginning of, of, of Douglas Adams' Babelfish translator. And that will really change the way we collaborate around the world, these type of technologies. And again, it uses these machine learning algorithms I've been telling you about. Uh, uh, many algorithms, and these are just two of them I've talked about. And, and of course, uh, uh, along with all the good things, there are also some bad things come. So let me see if I can get any sound on this one. Is it? Can I just play it? Play it. Play it. This is a regular new car. The masking tape is only there because we agreed to obscure its make and model. We'll give them the illusion they control the car for now. Kaufman has been working on this for five years with multiple research teams. Will I hit the fluids? Oh my gosh. 
There we go. There we go. What's that? What's that? What's that? <laughs> That's, yeah, the windshield wiper fluid. <laughs> no, wait. Is, is, so this is something that a hacker hit. <laughs> That's right. A hacker. Like, obviously, you didn't turn on the windshield I did wiper. Not. <laughs> Using a laptop, the hacker dialed the car's emergency communication system and transmitted a series of tones that flooded it with data. As the car's computer tried sorting it out, the hacker inserted an attack that reprogrammed the software, gaining total remote control. Uh, oh my God. The horn. <laughs> Doing that? The horn. They could control uh, the, pet, the gas, the acceleration. They could control the braking. That's right. And they could do this from anywhere in the world. So just try, uh, stop at the cones here. She thinks she's going to be able to stop right at those cones. Let's make sure that she can't. She's going to drive right through them. All right. Have complete control of that brake. All right. Here we go. Oh, no, 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 no. No, 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 no. Brakes I cannot. Work, right? Oh, my God. I can't operate the brakes at all. Oh, my word. That is frightening. That is frightening. That is frightening. Okay, so... Um, it really is, uh, 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 along with all the good things, you will find some bad things. And uh, that's why, personally, I'm slightly scared. Tesla have just downloaded intelligent software for their cars. Uh, there are vulnerabilities there, and you need to be careful. Okay, so I'd just like to conclude on a slightly lighter note, or maybe a more serious note, depending on what your take is, about, we've talked about smart applications. Are they really intelligent or not? And so this is a definition from a, a well-known textbook on AI. The assertion that machines could act as if they were intelligent is called weak AI. Uh, and the assertion that machines that do so actually are thinking by themselves is something called strong AI hypothesis. And all the, all the computers, all the robots and things we see in movies are, of course, thinking like, uh, you know, C-3PO, R2-D2, and so on. Uh, they're, they're, they're as if they're intelligent and able independent thought. So let's just have a look at that uh, to finish up with. So you, many of you have seen the, the movie about Alan Turing and the, it's called The Imitation Game, which is actually a version of what was the Turing test. Alan Turing considered the possibility of artificial intelligence but just, just around the end of the Second World War. And he, he, he came up with the idea that instead of talking about can machines think, let's just make it rather pragmatic. If I have a computer in one room and Jim Hogan in the other room and I can't see, can I interrogate them and can I tell from the answers that that's a person, Jim, or a computer? And that's the Turing test, basically. Uh, and uh, uh, the imitation game was, was, was what he called it also in one of these things. And this is a picture from the movie uh, of him playing with uh, what was called the bomb, which, which did the translation of the uh, Enigma encrypted codes for the German Navy uh, submarines, the U-boats. And uh, uh, of course, it wasn't like in the movie. Turing actually wasn't very interested and wouldn't have been allowed anywhere near any hardware. The, the team built it, but, but nonetheless, he was the inspiration for much of that. But the actual hardware was first built by the Polish intelligent community. So they should deserve some credit. They don't get any in the film. All right. So the, it's a Hollywood version, but it's well worth seeing. Okay. So it, here we are, 1997. This is uh, Gary Kasparov, world champion. And this is the person, here's the, here's the chess player, and this is the person moving the pieces according to what the computer says. This is Deep Blue. This was a, a famous challenge of IBM's Deep Blue computer versus the world champion. And uh, as is well known, Kasparov lost. And so, uh, you know, is that intelligence? We would have said prior to that that, you know, playing chess is something human. It requires some intelligence, some understanding. Uh, yet the computer here is beating the world's best players. Is that intelligent? Well, in fact, it's not in, in any sensible way. This is weak AI because it's just a very powerful computer and can look all possible moves further ahead than a person can. It doesn't play by intuition, by, by understanding the weaknesses of a position. It just looks at everything and chooses the best position according to a scoring algorithm. And uh, that is enough to beat the world champion. So 
it's brute force, basically, simulating intelligence. So it's a simulation of intelligence. So then 10 years or so later, uh, IBM took on another challenge. Now, the, in America, there's a, there's a, I don't know if it's in Australia, but there's this rather strange game called Jeopardy. Uh, and um, it, 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 it's, it's, it's in, instead of the answers, it gives you the answers, and you have to guess the question. So, you know, you would say Brussels, and you'd have to say, what is the capital of Belgium, or something like that, right? And so, uh, teaching a computer to beat the two best Jeopardy players is a non-trivial thing, because you have to give it all sorts of knowledge about dinosaurs, about notable women, about composers by country, about Belgium, for God's sake, right? <laughs> Um, and, and so on. So you have to give it all sorts of random knowledge. You have to interpret the questions. The questions are somewhat rather quirky and so on. Uh, and what, what happened was, uh, in the game against the two best players in 2011, Watson actually won. And so the question is, is Watson intelligent? Well, what actually they also showed, they showed to the the people watching, not to the contestants, Watson's top five guesses, what the answer should be. And so you could see what the possible guesses. And, and the answer was often right, the top one, but the other ones could be completely wrong. Had no understanding of what the question was. He'd gone completely off in the wrong way, not realizing what was going on. And so um, there's a, a philosopher, John Searle, at Berkeley, uh, and, and he has this Chinese room paradox. So this is where Someone's putting things in here, questions in Chinese. Here's John Searle, and he's looking up, if I get this thing, what do I put out? I put out that. And so he's just doing what's told by this algorithm. And here, this person sees answers to the questions coming in. And he would say that there's understanding in there. But, but Searle says, well, I don't speak Chinese. I have no understanding. This is just an algorithm. This is not actual intelligence. This is simulating intelligence. And so what he said about uh, about Jeopardy and Watson was that, you know, from Watson's answers, you could see it had no understanding whatsoever. It had no realization it was playing a game. It had no realization that it won, all right? It certainly uh, is not an intelligent computer. So what we're seeing then is imitations of computing, imitations of intelligence, weak AI. And what is worrying some people, and there are lots of people, uh, uh, who, who uh, Stephen Hawking has written an uh, open letter saying the dangers of AI. So will we have R2-D2 coming on the stage to rescue us, right? Or, or will we have um, Arnie, uh, Skynet, coming to destroy us? Or will you fall in love with your operating system, right? So, you know, uh, these are interesting challenges. Uh, and uh, there are some people, this is... Uh, Mr. Kurzweil, who believes that, you know, looking at the, the way Moore's law has been going, that uh, we, we're now up to billions of transistors on the chip. A brain has around 400, a couple of hundred billion neurons, so it won't be long before you can have that sort of complexity, and then computers will begin to become intelligent. Well, I don't think it's as simple as that, uh, and I'm making it a little more simple than Mr. Kurzweil says. But there are some people who believe there is a singularity and computers will then be able to design more intelligent computers and they will streak ahead of the human race. And, uh, you know, as, as it could be, you know, it would be a great achievement to invent artificial intelligence, but it could be the last achievement of the human race, is what uh, some people say. But uh, Feynman's view of, of computers was rather different. When he gave this popular talk at Eslin, this is the analogy he used. Uh, okay, so this is a file, and so the computer just says what it ha he picks a card, and it says what you do, and he goes over to the filing cabinet, picks the next card, brings it back, does what it says, puts the card back, and that's what it does, right? That's basically the heart of a computer, is just like a very dumb file clerk, is what Feynman calls it. But because it can do it incredibly fast, it looks very smart. And so this is what Feynman describes. The inside of a computer is as dumb as hell, but it goes like mad. And so you have these two views, and uh, it's really up to you to make the future. And 
one of my concerns is that you will see smart everything coming out, smart cities, smart houses, smart cars, uh, with all these algorithms in. And they will do all sorts of wonderful things. There will be downsides. I've shown you some of the downsides. Um, but they also have the potential to replace jobs. So I was just listening. I live in Seattle, and there are lots of mountains there. And in Oregon, they have, on the top of mountains, they have fire lookouts because they have lots of forest fires. And they used to have 300 fire lookouts in Oregon. Uh, and each of them was manned by, by people. But now they have only 40 because on the other ones, they put cameras, very high resolution cameras, with computers that can tell whether it's smoke, whether it's not, whether it's a fire. And of course, the computer doesn't go to sleep, doesn't get tired, doesn't get bored. It does it all the time. So they've already replaced, of the 300, they've replaced 260 by these computers. And so that's just a very simple example of how jobs will be displaced by these smart applications. And the question is, can we create new types of jobs that will fill the void and it's an interesting challenge and I think that's that's the real uh, challenge for society. The challenge for computer science is perhaps this. I said that we have you know several hundred billion neurons in our brain. Um, we could make a computer with seven hundred several hundred billion transistors. What's the difference? Why is one intelligent and one not? What makes people conscious and and that's this is a Daniel Dennett has a book called Consciousness Explained. I have to tell you, I didn't understand it, right? He didn't explain it for me. Uh, and and this is, in that book, he also says, human consciousness is about the last surviving mystery. So it, it's, it's a really interesting challenge and something that we should, uh, both a research challenge, but there's also a social challenge of these non-sentient computers, these clever algorithms, doing things better than humans and replacing lots of jobs. And I think that's, you, we really need to get lots of young people recognizing that, that they, they need to have jobs and they need to actually find jobs where there are going to be jobs. There are going to be lots of them displaced and therefore understanding the, the new world coming along, understanding a little bit about algorithms and, and IT is going to be an important part for their career. So. Uh, We need to engage the next generation in computer science, in my view. So uh, in, in the US, you see that the, the, the distribution of students and their subjects goes to the humanities and social sciences. And you see also predictions of jobs. And the jobs is the sciences and engineering. And there's sort of a mismatch between them. And these people will accumulate big debts. But will they get jobs that will enable them to pay off the debts very easily? So that's the challenge. We really do need to engage the next generation in, in understanding and, and being excited by the possibilities of computer science. Turing, when he was a grad student, did, did Turing machines. Sergey Brin and, 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 and Larry Page did Page rank. Can, can, can you guys go and invent something equally transformative? I think it's really possible. Thank you very much for listening. So our thanks to Tony, we'll take questions. And if we could uh, have the link to UQ with audio to please, so we can take some questions there if need be. Questions for Tony, yeah. No, why, why don't you try again? Because I, I wasn't sure I did make that distinction. So why don't you uh, explain <laughs> okay. what distinction I made? <laughs> Hello? Do you read me? All right. Okay. So in this talk, you were talking about uh, embodied autonomous agents. You specified we're talking about cars that drive themselves. Yeah. I'm thinking about autonomous agents that exist more in the cloud. Things like if you think about uh, trading, trading today is performed mostly by algorithms, right? So you've made this distinction. Um, can you comment on what and how you see this as different? And, um, no, well, okay, so uh, I, I don't think I would make that distinction. I, I think uh, algorithmic trading is, is clearly a reality at the moment and is, is really um, something that's really interesting and potentially dangerous. 
Um, uh, and so is, you know, an application which is based in a car. But the car couldn't be communicating with processing power in the cloud. So I don't see that they're so distinct. Right. You don't necessarily have to have the computing resources right by you. Uh, and, uh, you know, for example, the University of uh, QUT doesn't necessarily have to have huge computing resources. It could use commercial clouds for, for much of its computing. And so uh, I don't see the distinction, really. But, but it is true that a car is really a distributed computing system, which is very complex. Uh, and uh, the cloud is, is a much more generic general purpose computing system. Yeah. Thank you. Okay, at the back there, please. Thank you very much for a wonderful presentation. I have a question um, about whether you think computers and computer science makes humans more intelligent, both as individuals or collectively, or are we still as stupid as ever? <laughs> um, Actually, one of my heroes is this guy, um, Licklider. Uh, and he had this idea of a human-computer symbiosis. And I personally think that um, uh, a more, rather than computers becoming self-aware and so on, a much more plausible view is that you'll have humans supported by computers and together they can make better decisions. So that seems to me a much more positive view of the future. And I think that's actually a good thing, but you, but you will see lots of these uh, where humans are out of the loop and it's slightly scary. And uh, uh, I, I think that I would probably like the person running my nuclear plant to have a human in the loop as well as, you know, the computer observing what's going on and making decisions. But um, the trouble with these expert systems is, you know, if you take a medical expert system, will they ever convince doctors that they're better than doctors because they know all the papers, they know the research, and, and doctors are human. We don't know all these things. But on the other hand, a doctor would like to know why the computer is recommending that treatment. And so you have to have some way of actually interacting and the computer showing it's not just a black box. There are reasons you take this bit, you take that bit, and so on. So. Another area which I didn't talk about that I think is important is about the ability to do storytelling with lots of data and the fact that you can actually explain how you get your conclusion by taking this with this with that. And so one of the things that um, a different talk, it's about the fourth paradigm, if you like, data intensive science, is, is climate change, which of course um, is very controversial in the US and also Australia. Otherwise, everybody else takes it for granted. But um, Apparently not Australia and the US. Um, but, but you see, you have lots of data and you can show that by using this data, this data, you can show that there's a great probability. But you have to allow other people who are skeptics to say, well, you take this data with that data with this data, you get a different conclusion. And you allow people to choose. So I think actually um, computers with people can be very <coughs> much more powerful. And that's, that's a much more positive view of the future uh, in my, that, that I look forward to. Thank you. I might just throw at the stage to David at UQ. Do you have any questions from your room there, David? Can you hear us? Yes, we can. Yeah, Linda? Yeah. Maybe just come over by the mic. I've got a question, um, a sort of catastrophizing question. I read a thriller a few years ago by Philip Kerr called Gridiron about a building that's a smart building and state of the art, and it, the code gets corrupted by a computer game and starts to kill everyone in the building. And in the recent <laughs> film Ex Machina, the guy ends up trapped in that smart building because the robots outwitted him and buggered off. Yeah, and yeah, no, it's a scary thing. Does all this thing. stuff make us a lot less safe because stuff can go wrong? No, well, I, I absolutely agree with you. It's, it's all very well having smart buildings and everything else. Um, Ex Machina was a very interesting, I could have taken that as one of the examples. That's really a sort of complicated Turing test and, and actually she passes and outwits the humans uh, uh, and leaves him locked in with a dead body, yes. Uh, <laughs> um, but no, I think, I think it's, you have to be aware that with all these technologies, there's a downside. And I, I, I'm not sure that we're sufficiently aware. Uh, you know, for, for example, lots of people uh, put apps on their phones. Now, a phone is not, smartphone is just a computer and it's vulnerable to viruses and things like that. And these free apps, everybody loves them, but actually, why do they need to know your location? 
Why are they free? What's their business model? Well, their business model is you. They're selling information about you to other people. And so I think awareness of the fact that software can be good and can be bad. And I, I agree with you. I would not like to be totally under the control of software without a way of playing escape and, and getting out of the program and being able to unlock the doors manually. So would you like a Google self-driving car without a steering wheel or brakes? I personally wouldn't, all right? But, but you know, we'll see what happens. Uh, no, a good question, absolutely. It's, it's, uh, it, it means there's lots of problems for computer scientists to work on. So we're starting to run out of time, so I might just take one or two more questions from either room. So we have one, one from Yuku and one from here, and we'll leave it at that, I think. Yeah, yeah please go ahead. Yeah, um, so you talk about um, the strong and weak AI, um, and it kind of seems like people suggest uh, weak AI is not important to strong AI, but if, if you think about a human, it sort of seems like they rely on a whole bunch of weak AI capabilities in order to have this strong AI effect. Like you need to be able to see something and interpret that. And so do you think that you could build strong AI by stitching together lots and lots of weak AI capabilities? Uh, it's a good question and you're absolutely right. Uh, the weak AI is, is going to be all around us. It's going to be able to recognize things. It's going to be able to listen to things. Uh, your smart TV will be listening to you and reporting on you in principle. So you have to be careful what you say. Uh, uh, <laughs> no, it's the scary stuff. And uh, I was just listening what Snowden said that my, my, my cell phone can be turned on by GCHQ and they can be listening as I speak at this moment without me doing anything about it. Um, uh, will, will lots of AI weak AI type applications, which are the ones we're going to see, will that constitute self-awareness? I don't think it will. I think there's a missing component, but you know, it's going to, systems are going to get more and more simulating real intelligence. So uh, it's a question of degree, but I don't think you'll have the, the, the robots of science fiction where people can actually go and initiate actions and thoughts and things totally independently. Uh, consciousness. That's my personal view. But it, it's a research problem. Let's go do it. Or not, as the case may be. <laughs> I'll just take one final question here. Um, yes. Final question is, if that's the third age is embodiment, what do you think the fourth age is? <laughs> Look at your head. I, well, that's interesting. Uh, Butler talks about 30-year periods, right? So uh, we've got until 2040 to figure out what the next one is. But, but uh, no, I, you know, it's just a, I just find it quite a convenient way to classify what we've been doing. You know, we first of all figuring out what computers can do by themselves, uh, and that's the first stage. Second, when you connect them together, and now we're putting intelligence in there to make them do clever things. Uh, maybe there's a fourth age. That's 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 to be thought of.